ومن أحسن قولا ممن دعا إلى الله وعمل صالحا وقال إنني من المسلمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته والحمد لله وحده والصلاة والسلام على من لا نبي بعده أما بعد uh, today, inshallah, we're going to continue our series about uh, heaven uh, and hell, and we're still on the descriptions of Jahannam. And today, what we're going to do is talk about specific sins that have been threatened with Jahannam. So what are some of the sins that cause a person to enter into Jahannam? Now, obviously, uh, there are certain groups of people and certain people by name that have been threatened with Jahannam. There's only a few uh, in the Quran uh, and in the Sunnah. Uh, so for example, uh, Fir'aun, of course, is mentioned very clearly in the Quran in Surah Hud, verse 98. He shall lead his people and he shall take them into the fire of hell. And the wives of Lut and Nuh, uh, the prophets of Allah, Nuh and Lut, their wives betrayed their husbands, uh, their, their wives helped the enemies uh, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala against their husbands. And so Allah says in the Quran in Surah Tahrim, The two of them, it will be said to them to enter Jahannam with those that are entering Jahannam. And of course, uh, Abu Lahab, Tabbatida Abi Lahab, and also the wife of uh, Abu Lahab. So the both of them are also uh, uh, promised to enter Jahannam. And of course, uh, number one on the list should of course be Iblis himself. Allah, as Allah says in the Quran. And from the very beginning of times, Allah says in the, in the Quran that Allah says the truth and only the truth shall I, shall I say. I shall fill Jahannam with you and with all those who follow you. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that Iblis and his followers will fill Jahannam. By name, Iblis is mentioned. So obviously there are small groups of people. I mean, by name, we only have a handful. What I'm talking about in this lecture are the descriptions. What are the categories of the people and the sins that lead into Jahannam? So we have to divide this talk into two. The first is going to be those that are permanently in Jahannam. And the second are the sins that believers might do that are punished by the fire of Jahannam. Now remember a few lectures ago, I had mentioned that nobody who did sajda, nobody who worshipped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will actually enter Jahannam proper. But they shall still be punished by Jahannam. They shall still be punished through the fire of Jahannam while they're not actually in Jahannam. And so there was going to be a section, uh, and I said that Allah knows best, it seems to be the A'raf, it seems to be that uh, plateau, that uh, there will be people in various levels on that plateau. And so the heat and the fumes and the exhaustion of Jahannam shall reach those people, each one in accordance with where they are. And therefore, even the sinners who are believers, even the fusaq of the believers are going to be in various degrees uh, of uh, the, the araf. And it seems to be that uh, depending on their piety and their sins, uh, that they're going to be allocated a place on the araf. So both the time that they're going to remain outside of Jannah and the location that they're going to be punished in will be dependent upon the number of good deeds versus the number of bad deeds. So today we're going to discuss both of these categories, those that are permanently in Jahannam and then the sins of the believers that have been threatened with uh, Jahannam. And as for those that are permanently in Jahannam, it is really one large category that is comes under kufr. So the kafir, and who is the kafir? The kafir is the one who does not have iman. The literal definition of kufr is the absence of iman. You either have iman or you don't. If you don't, then you are a kafir. So the default is that the one who does not have iman shall not enter Jahannam. Now under this category are multiple categories. Under the category of kufr, there are many categories. So you can have the kufr that entails the worship of other than Allah, which is of course uh, shirk. And of course the worst type of shirk is idolatry. And so when you worship other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is a type of shirk. Uh, kufr is broader than shirk however, because shirk is one category of kufr. Kufr can also be to not submit to Allah and His Messenger out of arrogance, which is the kufr 
of Iblis. This is the kufr of kibr or takabbur, that a person knows the truth. It's also called kufr of inad. You know the truth and then you refuse to accept the truth because you are too arrogant to accept the truth. And that is the worst category of kufr without exception uh, in terms of uh, the, the, the level of, of kufr in it. And of course, uh, kufr of, of nifaq is under this, by the way, as well, because the munafiq knows the truth and yet he has decided to uh, reject it. Uh, and uh, other, another type of kufr is the kufr of rejecting, not believing, having seen the evidences of Islam and having seen the truth of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and then you belie the message, you reject the message like Fir'aun, that he knew the truth and he then rejects the message. This is, uh, Fir'aun is also a type of kufr of arrogance. So again, there's an element of, of, of some of these in on all of these uh, categories. Uh, or the Quraysh of Mecca, that they simply refuse to accept the message of Islam. You also have the kufr of the one who uh, simply does not care to examine why he is here on earth. The kufr of uh, the one who is too lazy to even look at his life. The kufr of the one who simply allows life to go on and doesn't care about pursuing the intellectual reasons of why am I here, who put me here, what's going to happen after life and death. So that is a kufr of laziness, a kufr of i'rad, the kufr of turning away. All of this and others are categories of kufr and anyone who does not submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a kafir and anyone who has seen the truth and knows the truth and rejects the truth is also a kafir. And uh, there are many evidences for this. Uh, of them is Surah Al Imran, verse 151. Allah says, that we're going to cause the hearts of those who have committed shirk with Allah to be full of fear because they have done something that Allah has not allowed them to do, their abode is going to be the fire. Both the kafir and the mushrik, their abode will be the fire of hell. Surah Tawbah verse 73, Ya ayyuhal nabiyu jahid al-kuffara wal munafiqina waghrud alayhim wa ma'wahum jahannam. O Prophet, be strict against the kafir and the uh, munafiq and uh, wage against them jihad and their abode is going to be jahannam. Wa ma'wahum jahannam. So Allah is saying, to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that the mushrik and the kafir, their abode is going to be Jahannam. And Allah says specifically with regards to the mushrikeen that ma kana lil mushrikeena an ya'muru masajid Allahi shahideena ala anfusihim bil kufr ulaika habitat a'maluhum wa fil nari hum khalidun those who worship idols the mushrikun they are not allowed to uh, basically the, the context is to uh, take care of the haram of Mecca they're not allowed to do that uh, because they are testifying to themselves that they have kufr their good deeds will be in vain and they will be in the fire of hell permanently. So again, it's very clear that those who commit kufr or shirk, that they shall be in the fire of hell. Anyone who is too arrogant to submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will enter into Jahannam. Surah Al-Zumr verse 60, أَلَيْسَ فِي جَهَنَّمَ مَثْوَلْ لِلْمُتَكَبِّرِينَ Isn't there enough of an abode of Jahannam? There's plenty of space, there's plenty of, of, of opportunities over there for the mutakabbir to go to Jahannam. So the mutakabbir means the one who is too arrogant to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anybody who refuses to submit to Allah will enter up and in, 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 enter in Jahannam. Surah Al-Ra'd verse 18. لِلَّذِينَ اسْتَجَابُوا لِرَبِّهِمُ الْحُسْنَى وَالَّذِينَ لَمْ يَسْتَجِيبُوا لَهُ Those who respond to the call of their Lord, they shall get Jannah. Those who do not respond to the call of their Lord, Allah says, وَمَأْوَاهُمْ جَهَنَّمُ وَبِئْسَ الْمَصِيرُ So, وَالَّذِينَ لَمْ يَسْتَجِيبُوا Those who do not respond to the call of Allah, Allah ends the verse by saying, their abode is going to be in Jahannam. Now, somebody can say, why are you going to so much detail? in this simple case. The response is that we live in a time and a place where uh, this notion has become politically incorrect. It has become something that people are even scared to say, even though it is common sense and logical, and it is the clear and explicit commandments of the Quran and the Sunnah and the unanimous consensus of the entirety of this Ummah up until modern times, that anybody who rejects Islam is not going to enter Jahannam. Nobody shall enter Jahannam, uh, sorry, is not going to enter Jannah. Nobody is going to enter Jannah except one who has faith. This is something that is very clear. So anybody
somebody who rejects faith knowingly. Now as for the one who doesn't know, hasn't heard of Islam, I spoke about that in a longer Q&A. You can log on and check to the internet and I have a whole lecture about that person that there is a chance if the person has never heard of Islam. But the person who knows the truth and the person who, who understands the truth and then decides to not follow the truth, that person, he never desired Allah and so why should Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward him? That therefore the Quran is very clear. Anybody who rejects the Quran, anybody who rejects the day of judgment, anybody who rejects the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that person shall permanently be in Jahannam. So for example, and again the verses are too many to mention, but unfortunately people have derived their theology from what is politically correct and they do not derive their theology from the Quran, so this is to be expected. No matter how difficult this notion is, it is the Quranic notion and it is the logical notion. Why should a person who doesn't have faith be rewarded and then what is going to happen to the one of faith? A person who rejects Allah will not be rewarded by Allah, it's as simple as that. So Allah says in the Quran, that uh, we have revealed to you this dhikr, man a'rada anhu, whoever turns away from this dhikr, that fa'innahu yahmil al there was no khalidina fihi, that whoever turns away, Allah says in the Quran, he shall be permanently in Jahannam, whoever turns away from the Quran shall be permanently in Jahannam. So also uh, Surah Al-Ra'd, Allah mentions, whoever rejects the day of judgment shall be in Jahannam permanently. So Allah says, وَإِن تَعْجَبْ فَعَجَبٌ قَوْلُهُمْ أَيْذَا كُنَّا تُرَابٍ أَيْنَّ لَفِي خَلْقٍ جَدِيدٍ أُولَٰئِكَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا بِرَبِّهِمْ وَأُولَٰئِكَ الْأَغْلَالُ فِي عَنَاقِهِمْ وَأُولَٰئِكَ أَصْحَابُ النَّارِ هُمْ فِيهَا خَالِدُونَ I'm purposely choosing verses that link a rejection of the Quran and a rejection of the day of judgment and a rejection of, of belief in heaven and hell and a rejection of the worshiping of Allah explicitly to Jahannam. In Surah Al-Ra'd verse five, Allah says, anybody who doubts the day of judgment and who mocks the day of judgment, that person, if you doubt the power of Allah and reject the power of Allah to resurrect you, then you shall be in the fire of hell permanently in it. And in Surah Al-Muddathir, Allah says in the Quran, the angels will ask the believers, how did you end up in Jahannam? And they will respond, Lam min al We did not used to pray. We did not used to feed the poor. We used to waste our time with all those who rejected uh, uh, you know, Islam. And we used to deny the day of judgment until death came to us. Notice the reason why they're in Jahannam, they refuse to submit, they refuse to worship, they make fun of Islam, they reject the day of judgment. So what is going to happen? Why should the one who doesn't believe in the hereafter after be rewarded in the hereafter? Why should the one who didn't spend as a millisecond of their time in this world working for the hereafter be rewarded for the hereafter? It's very simple. You get what you intend. If you intended the hereafter and you worked for the hereafter, you shall get the hereafter. And if you did not intend the hereafter and you only wanted this dunya, well then you will get your dunya, but you will not get the akhirah. Also the Quran is very clear that uh, social pressure is not an acceptable excuse that simply because the people of your time and place did something it's not an excuse in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Surah An-Nisa verse 97 Allah says those people whom the angels they take their souls and they were uh, committing shirk here means committing shirk uh, the angels will say to them that what were you doing? Why didn't you worship Allah? And they will say that we were oppressed. Everybody forced us to do this. And so the angels will say, wasn't the land of Allah vast that you could find another place to worship Allah in? Now, by the way, this applies to those who do not accept Islam because of social pressure. And Allah makes an excuse that those who are genuinely persecuted, they have no place to go, perhaps Allah can forgive that they, they pretended otherwise and their hearts were full of Iman. But any land, that forces you to worship other than Allah, you're not allowed to live in that land. Any land that attempts to stop you from your pure faith and from praying and from fasting, any land that does not allow you to be a Muslim, your loyalties are always to your Creator first and foremost. You do not betray, you do not uh, do something that is treacherous, but your ultimate loyalty is to your Creator. So you choose the land that allows you to be who you are, and then you may be faithful to the laws of the land insofar as it does not force you to uh, do something that is uh, sinful. So the point being that Allah Azza wa Jal explicitly mentions in the Quran that saying that, oh, it was difficult, the people around us did something, that's not gonna be good enough. Surah Al-Ahzab, verse 64 to 67, Allah says in the Quran, 
that those who uh, have kufr, uh, those that have committed kufr, Allah has cursed them and Allah Azza wa has prepared for them Jahannam and they shall be in it forever. And uh, they will say in Jahannam, woe to us, how we wish we had followed Allah and His Messenger. Woe to us, instead we followed قَالُوا رَبَّنَا إِنَّا طَعْنَا سَادَتَنَا وَكُبْرَاءَنَا فَأَضَلُّونَ السَّبِيلَ Instead we followed our elders and leaders, and we followed our politicians and whatnot, and they were the ones who led us astray. And they will invoke in Jahannam, O oh Allah, those leaders that misguided us, give them double the punishment. You see, when it comes to guidance and misguidance, Allah has given all of us a mind. Allah has given all of us an intellect. Allah has given all of us common sense. And therefore, it is up to every individual to think long and hard about who his creator is. What is the purpose of life? What will happen after death? Look into the different religions and then any sincere person will find the truth of Islam. If a person simply follows the leaders and follows the land that they live in and follows the culture, knowing that there is a religion of Islam and still rejecting it, that person has no chance and they shall be in Jahannam permanently. The worst of the people who will be in Jahannam are those who are leaders of kufr, those that are preventing people from worshiping Allah. These people are called in the Quran, callers to Jahannam. Literally, Allah has a title for them. Surah Al-Baqarah verse 221, They are the du'at of a nar. We seek Allah's refuge. We want to be du'at to Jannah. We want to be du'at to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We want to be the preachers who are calling towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That, as Allah says in the Quran, uh, وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَوْلُ مِمَّنْ دَعَى إِلَى اللَّهِ We want to be the ones who are calling to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But there are a category of people, they are the worst of the worst, and they're calling to Jahannam. So they are called Du'at of Jahannam. And of course, the classic example for this is Fir'aun. يَقْدُمُ قَوْمُهُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ فَأَوْرَدَهُمُ النَّارِ He shall lead his followers, like the Pied Piper, if you know the tale. He shall lead his followers into Jahannam, and they shall be uh, in Jahannam forever. And so Allah calls them uh, the callers to hell. And in Surah Al-Qasas, وَجَعَلْنَاهُمْ أَئِمَّةً يَدْعُونَ إِلَى النَّارِ we made them imams, these evil people that are calling towards the fire of hell. These are Fir'aun and his followers. They are a'imma, but not of good. They're imams, but not of piety. They're imams, but not of the Quran and Sunnah. They are the imams that are calling towards the fire of hell. We seek Allah's refuge from that. So this is part one of our lecture. And that is those that shall be in Jahannam proper and they will be in Jahannam forever. As I have said multiple times, that anybody who enters Jahannam through the doors of Jahannam shall be in Jahannam forever. Who shall that person be? Those are the, the people who have no Iman and have rejected Allah and they are upon Kufr. And Kufr has many categories. You have hypocrisy and we already mentioned they shall be the lowest ranks of the fire of hell. You have Shirk and these are those who worship other gods. You have Kufr for multiple reasons. And then you have those that are calling to Kufr and they will be the ones leading their people into uh, uh, the uh, doors of Jahannam. So these are the people that will be in Jahannam proper and they shall be permanent in Jahannam. We now move on to the second half of our lecture and that is who shall be threatened with Jahannam even though they have Iman, okay? So what sins are that bad that there is a threat of going to Jahannam? Because you see, generically speaking, sins uh, of course will bring about problems, but most of the sins even if a person commits them without repentance, but they still have salah and zakah and good deeds, most of these sins will be expiated, kafara, through istighfar, through generic tawbah, through the problems and trials of this world, every pain and suffering, through uh, grief and anxiety, through issues of the grave we seek Allah's refuge, through the anxiety on the day of judgment itself, through crossing over the sirat, all of these things will be a kafara for the sins that a person has done. And so generally speaking, the sins that the, the believer does, the one who is regular in the prayers avoids the major sins, you know, the minor sins that we're all guilty of, generally speaking, the uh, kafara will be through other means, not Jahannam. Generally speaking, Jahannam will not be given to the one who was a, uh, attempted to be a righteous Muslim and repented to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even though of course we cannot 
uh, state with certainty that any individual has reached that level. This should not cause us to be arrogant, but it should cause us to be hopeful that Allah says in the Quran, إِن تَجْتَنِبُوا كَبَائِرَ مَا تُنْهَوْنَ عَنْهُ نُكَفِّرْ عَنْكُمْ سَيِّئَاتِكُمْ وَنُدْخِلْكُمْ مُدْخَلًا كَرِيمًا That if you avoid the major sins, then we shall forgive the minor ones and cause you to enter a noble abode which is Jannah. So generally speaking, the sins that we do on a daily basis that we should not do, we shall be uh, not necessarily just forgiven scot-free, but even if something happens, it's not gonna be Jahannam. So uh, Anib ibn Taymiyyah mentions the 10 ways that sins are forgiven and punished. Uh, and uh, I, give, I have given a longer talk, talk about that. You can find that online. So what we're worried about now in the next you know, 20, 20 minutes or so, what we wanna discuss is what are those sins that are so heinous, so vulgar, so evil, that people have been threatened with Jahannam just for those sins. So these are the major sins threatened with Jahannam. And even if you're a Muslim, it is possible, a'udhu billah, to end up in Jahannam because of these sins. Well, before I begin a list, let's talk about some general descriptions. In the famous hadith in Bukhari and Muslim, the Prophet sallallahu said, Jannah and Jahannam were having an argument. They're having a discussion. That Jannah and Nar were having a, uh, a, a debate between the two of them. How? Allah knows best. We believe that every entity has consciousness and we believe that every creation of Allah has an awareness. And so Jannah and Jahannam have the same type of awareness. They're having a discussion amongst themselves. And so Jahannam says, the fire of hell says that I have in me the mutakabbirin and the mutajabbirin. I have in me those that have kibr and those that have jabarut. And this means the pompous, the arrogant, they are in me. And then Jannah says the weak and the humble are in me. Each one is trying to, to you know, uh, score a point, let's say, right? And so the, the, the hadith goes on, and I'll come back to this hadith, inshallah, in a few weeks when we talk about descriptions of Jannah. The point being the key phrase here, who is or what is the primary characteristic of the people of, Jan of Jahannam? The single primary characteristic of the people of Jahannam is what? Mutakabbir and mutajabbir. The arrogant and the vulgar foul mouth, the ones that are pompous, the ones that are full of themselves. That is the number one characteristic. The ones that have arrogance, as our Prophet Sallallahu said, none who has the smallest amount of kibr shall enter Jannah. You cannot enter Jannah with kibr. There must be humility in front of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. There must be a sense of complete subservience to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Anybody who has arrogance in his or her heart, that, per, that heart cannot enter Jannah with that arrogance in there. Also, in the famous hadith in Sahih Muslim, our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Ala ukhbirukum bi ahli al-Jannah? Shouldn't I tell you of the people of Jannah, firstly Jannah? They said, yes. He said, Kullu da'ifin mutada'if. Every weak person who is assumed to be weak by the people around him. That the people that are meek and humble, the people that others assume to be nobodies, the people that are on the fringe of society, they shall be in Jannah. The humble, the meek, the poor, they're gonna be in Jannah. Then he said, should I not tell you of the people of Jahannam, or the people of the fire of hell? They said, yes. He said, Every single uh, angry, violent person, every single person who, Jawalv uh, means the one who, he is by nature evil, always vulgar, always saying bad and nasty things, the, the nasty, stingy person, the mustakbir, the one who has kibr in his heart. So notice the adjectives that our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to describe the default of the, of the people of Jahannam. They are the foul mouth, the vulgar, the pompous, the arrogant, the people that just they're nasty and mean. You don't wanna be around them. You don't wanna be around them because they just exude this negativity, this arrogance, everybody else is this and that, and we are that and that. Those types of people, the Prophet said, they're, they're not the people of Jannah, they are the people of uh, Jahannam. And in a famous hadith in Sahih Muslim, uh, our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said a very long hadith, the phrase that we're interested in, وَأَهْلُ النَّارِ خَمْسَةً Hadith is in Sahih Muslim. Uh, and the people of the fire are five. So he mentions five categories. Number one, الضعيف الذي لا زبر له الذين هم فيكم تبعا لا يبتغون أهلا ولا مالا. Number one, the weak resolve. 
the one who has no firm will to stop him from following the crowd basically, right? So what is meaning here is that if everybody goes in mob mentality, does a crime, he's just with them. If everybody goes and drinks, he's gonna be drinking with them. If everybody goes and you know commits a murder, he's gonna be with them. If everybody goes and commits shirk, I mean obviously we're not talking about shirk here per se because we're talking about the sins that a Muslim might do. So the point is that here we're talking about the person who just goes with the crowd. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that, uh, uh, the, that he doesn't seem to care about even his money and his family. Now, how you translate this phrase, there's a bit of a, a you know, difference of opinion. So what, the way I'm tra translating here is that the one of weak resolve, he just follows the crowd without having the courage to, to go against, so much so that even his family and wealth become secondary. He doesn't care about the safety of his family. He doesn't care about his money. He will just do whatever he wants to go with the crowd to appease people that will not help him on the day of judgment. So we have the first category, which is the weak resolve, simply seeing the whiff of a desire and he will follow it. Number two, the Prophet Sallallahu said, the khain, the dishonest person whose greed cannot be concealed. He is so greedy that lahu tama'a, the Prophet said, he is so greedy just for any penny earned. However he earns it, he doesn't care that no matter how small it might be, uh, the, the amount that he wants to, st to be greedy for, he's going to be dishonest to get that. So we have here, you know, the dishonest person. Number three, similar to that, is the fraudster, the hustler, who will betray anything, even if it means harming your family, harming your wealth, he wants to deceive you and he wants to get your wealth. These are similar, the, the khain and uh, the, the, the khada, the, 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 the khain and the one you khadi'uk is very similar. So the one who is dishonest and the one who is a fraudster, very similar things. The point is that he has no morals. He is so corrupt morally that he's willing to harm his family or your family to make a buck, right? That type of double crossing, conniving, you know, uh, person that has no morality whatsoever, no conscience at all. This is what is being mentioned in this uh, hadith. And then the Prophet mentioned, uh, the, the narrator uh, says his memory is, is, is confused, either the miser or the liar. And if he's, it is miser, then he means the miserly to the one who is so stingy that he does not fulfill his rights even to his family and to the zakat is not given. And the liar, uh, the one who is constantly lying, the one who is always double crossing, you cannot trust him at all. And then the final thing that is mentioned is uh, the ashamthir, and this is a very obscure word, it hardly occurs. And this means, uh, it has been narrated in the hadith itself, it is translated or it is explained uh, in the hadith itself, that it is the one who is foul mouth, the one who is vulgar, the one who is constantly just saying nasty things about other people. You know, he is lying, slandering, vulgarities come. So his mouth is so disgusting that nobody wants to be around him. Notice all of these characteristics, you don't even have to be a Muslim to not like this person. Humanity despises every one of these characteristics. Humanity despises every one of these characteristics. Now, these are generic descriptions of the people of Jahannam. What we get is that the one whose character, who doesn't have a conscience, who doesn't have humility, the one who is just a foul mouth, arrogant, you know, vulgar person, that is the generic characteristic. We now have a list of sins that we're gonna conclude our uh, lecture with. And this is not an exhaustive list because again, it goes to how you want to interpret various hadith. I try to stick with those hadith and those verses that literally link the sin to the fire of hell. There are sins that are linked to Allah's la'na, there are sins that are linked to Allah's ghadab, and that's also a very important list. Today I wanted to restrict that those sins that specifically mention the fire of hell as a potential punishment. And we should always remember that these sins do not mean that the person who does them will inevitably end up in Jahannam. No, the doors of repentance are always open. Every one of these sins can be forgiven if the person turns to Allah and turns over a new leaf. As well, these sins may be forgiven uh, if the Allah wants them to be forgiven for whatever reason. It is possible that one good deed that a man does is so pure, so good that Allah accepts it and causes an entire lifetime of sins, including some of these to be forgiven. So we never give up hope of Allah's mercy. We never give up hope of Allah's rahmah. We are always optimistic. Nonetheless, we should be extra careful of these particular sins. The first of these is 
to have beliefs that go against uh, the correct beliefs of Islam. So to have uh, what is called deviations uh, and uh, these deviations, of course, I have spoken about this in another long lecture. This is the famous hadith of the 73 groups and whatnot. And we have to be careful here that we don't make the saved group to be a very narrow group of people of just five, 10 people in the world. The saved group uh, is the largest group of Muslims on earth. The generic belief of Islam, the six pillars of Islam, Anybody who believes in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the prophets and the books and the day of judgment and the, uh, uh, the uh, concept of Qadr and belief in heaven and hell, anybody who believes in the six pillars and who respects the Quran and Sunnah and respects the Sahaba, this is the general mainstream of Islam and inshaAllah ta'ala they are upon a lot of good and they are attempting to be with the jama'ah of the Muslims, alhamdulillah. The differences that might happen after this, generally speaking, are trivial. And we should not create animosity and hatred and tension between mainstream uh, versions of Islam that respect the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And as for those that reject uh, the sunnah or they have other interpretations, there is no doubt that that is problematic and they are under threat of punishment. This does not mean that they will enter Jahannam. It simply means that some of the ideologies that are held are so nasty, if you like, or so evil that there is a potential to be threatened by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala simply for holding that belief. And so, no doubt, I mean, the, the one who has very evil uh, ideas of let's say our mothers or let's say the Sahaba Abu Bakr Umar radiallahu anhu, that's not good at all. And it is possible that that person might be punished for that belief. Now I have spoken about the hadith of the 70 through 73 and sectarianism and this, I have spoken about this in many, many lectures. So please listen to those lectures. We are trying to be very fair to our texts. Uh, at the same time, we are very careful about creating sectarianism. We have to have that healthy balance. I firmly believe that mainstream uh, Islam in which the Quran and Sunnah is followed based upon the respect of the Sahaba, that this is the correct understanding of Islam. And I firmly believe that other uh, understandings of Islam are mistaken. That does not mean that we preach takfir a'udhu billah, that they are not kafir, the 72 groups. It also does not mean that we create sectarianism and hatred. There's a time and a place and a language and an audience to discuss the differences between the Muslim sects and the Muslim schisms and groups. Uh, and we speak generically and also Allah forgives the average person who doesn't have any knowledge, who just, um, uh, as long as they're Muslims. Again, somebody can say you just said that the average person is uh, following the crowd is not forgiven. The average person who worships an idol is not going to be forgiven. But the average person who worships Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then falls into a mistake within Islam cannot be compared to the one who worships an idol. There is a world of a difference. And so all of these 73 groups are within Islam. They're all Muslim and they will all eventually end up in Jannah. Some might be punished in, some might be punished in Jahannam and Allah is Ghafoor and Rahim. So this is the first category. So we have to make sure our theology is, is correct. At the same time, we have to be careful about becoming so obsessed with abstract concepts of theology that we neglect basic Islamic tenets such as mercy and tenderness and compassion and kindness. Middle balance always. The second uh, sin that is explicitly mentioned and linked to Jahannam that can happen within Islam is lying about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in a hadith that is reported by more Sahaba than any other hadith, whoever lies about me intentionally, let him, let him be prepared to seek his place in Jahannam. فَلْيَتَبَوَّأْ مَقْعَدَهُ مِنَ النَّارِ So lying about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is such a severe sin that the person is promised Jahannam because of that we seek Allah's refuge. The third sin that is very clearly linked to Jahannam and can uh, be given as a punishment even to the Muslim who commits it is obviously the sin of murder, the sin of killing an innocent soul and this is in fact in the Quran, وَمَن يَقْتُلْ مُؤْمِنًا مُتَعَمِّدًا فَجَزَاءُ جَهَنَّمُ خَالِدًا فِيهَا وَغَضِبَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَلَعْنَهُ وَعَدَ لَهُ عَذَابًا عَظِيمًا Whoever kills a believer intentionally without a just cause, that person shall be in Jahannam forever to be in it. Forever here means for a very, very long time, not forever means till, till infinity. And our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that a believer shall still have a room for leniency on the Day of Judgment as long as he has not shed innocent blood. 
a believer shall still have room for leniency on the day of judgment. There's still hope for forgiveness as long as he does not shed blood. So the third thing is murder. The fourth thing is uh, the uh, the punish the, the those that torture or those that uh, help tyrants in their torture. So those that are tyrannical, those that are you know being involved in the shedding of blood, those that are involved in civil war, those that are involved in pain and punishment, those that are helping the evil people in the world, even if they don't themselves you know do the murder, but they're on the teams or they're on the. So we're talking about here tyrannical regimes, we're talking about tyrants or evil people, or even thugs or mafia. If you're helping those evil people, even if you don't pick up the gun, or you don't pick up the whip yourself, but you're in those groups and movements, and in those regimes, then uh, Allah, Allah help you, because this is you are, you are literally risking going to Jahannam. There's nothing we can do about this. Allah says in the Quran, Surah Hud, verse 113, وَلَا تَرْكَنُوا إِلَى النَّارِ That do not uh, lean towards, don't even have your heart leaning towards them. Don't even have sympathy towards those that are causing dhulm in this world, or else the fire of hell will touch you. And our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, in the famous hadith in Bukhari and Muslim, two groups of people from the people of Jahannam, they are from my ummah and I have not seen them. Notice he says from my ummah and I have not seen them yet. Number one, the first category is that there's gonna be groups of people that they're gonna have whips like the tails of cows and they're gonna be going around hitting and beating people with. Now our scholars have interpreted this to mean these are the thugs that support the various regimes. These are the people who are the worst of the worst. They are the ones torturing other Muslims. They are the ones that are getting involved in, in, in just killing innocent people. So uh, the same concept of supporting tyranny and supporting injustice. And our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, hadith is in Musnad Abu Dawood of Al-Tayalisi with an authentic isnad, inna ashad al nasi adhaban yawm al-qiyamah, ashadduhum adhaban lin nasi fi dunya the worst of people who will be punished on the Day of Judgment will be those who are the worst in punishing people in this world. So, you know, the prisons, the torture chambers, you know, these types of people that are literally inflicting the worst type of pain or uh, the secret, you know, agents that go, or, you know, we seek Allah's refuge, you know, uh, killing innocent people, you know, the person was lured to a, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the embassy and then uh, killed and then cut into pieces. A'udhu billah, a'udhu billah. The people that did this, we know they are people who say, La ilaha Muhammad Rasulullah. We seek Allah's refuge. Wallahi, yani, how, how evil is it that for a price, for a sum of money and how much you sold yourself for some sum of money. Somebody paid you money and you literally suffocated a Muslim to death and you cut him into pieces and you put it in acid. Wallahi, how, yani how cheap can you be that for some money in this world? And then SubhanAllah, right, there was a complete tangent here, not definitely not prepared here. May Allah protect all of us, uh, all of us uh, in the, for saying all of this, but khair needs to be said. Wallahi, how sad is it that these people sold themselves for a sum of money and Allah humiliated them in this world before the hereafter. We don't know what's gonna happen in the hereafter, but even in this world, their names and pictures were posted everywhere. How do you think their families feel? How do you think their friends feel? How do you think now, subhanAllah, because this is the sunnah of Allah in His creation, that when you do something of this nature, they thought they had the protection of this regime and they had the protection of you know, the powerful princes behind them. What happened? What happened? SubhanAllah, humiliated in this world, pictures on every single newspaper and their names are known and their ranks are known and what did they gain? And they had to be punished slightly and they're gonna get, get off because obviously the prince is there. But still, the point being that this hadith is very clear here. In أَشَدَّ النَّاسِ عَذَابًا يَوْمُ الْقِيَامَةِ أَشَدُّهُمْ عَذَابًا لِلنَّاسِ فِي الدُّنْيَا The worst of people that will be punished on the Day of Judgment are the, those who punish mankind the worst in this world. We seek Allah's refuge. So this is one category of those that will be punished in Jahannam. Uh, another category, we already mentioned this, but we'll mention it again, is arrogance. The Muslim who has arrogance, a'udhu billah, a'udhu billah. Nobody should have arrogance in their heart. Arrogance should be eliminated from the heart. And this is manifested in many ways. For example, uh, the famous hadith of the one who lowers his pants. We talked about this in a fiqhi ways. The meaning of the lowering of the pants here, in those days, it was done, the lowering of the garment, it was done as a sign of arrogance that I am rich and I can flaunt the goods that I have. If somebody lowers without arrogance, I already gave the long lecture that pretty much 
uh, the majority of the scholars do not consider that to be uh, haram. But uh, the, the one who, for example, does this out of arrogance, the sin is the arrogance, not the lowering of the pants. Also, Ibn Salama, for example, said, the Prophet Sallallahu said that the one who drinks from utensils of gold and silver, that person, it is as if he is drinking the fire of hell into him. Now, who drinks from utensils of gold and silver? What is the purpose? It's not the utensil, once again, primarily it is the arrogance, right? You show off, you show who people, that you're gonna have a full goblet of gold and you'll be drinking from that goblet, or you're gonna be having something made out of complete gold and silver. The point is the showing off. And our Prophet ﷺ said, anybody who has an atom's weight of kibir shall not enter uh, Jannah. Uh, another category that is promised with Jahannam, we'll, we'll, we seek Allah's refuge, category number six in our list here, is those people that are charging riba. Notice charging riba is the major sin. As for taking riba, it is definitely a sin, but not to the same level as charging riba. And I've spoken about this in other lectures, you can listen to it. But charging riba, giving somebody a loan, and then saying, I want more back, or any type of defrauding of the people from their money, using tricks to take people's money unjustly, a'udhu billah. This category is promised with Jahannam. Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu, Allah says in Surah An-Nisa verse 29, la ta'kulu amwalakum baynakum bil batili, illa an takun tijaratan an taradim minkum, that do not eat uh, your wealth with batil, with unjustness, except if it is by, by willingness, that you both want to do the exchange, yes, but if you do it with batil, Allah says, وَمَنْ يَفْعَلْ ذَلِكَ عُدْوَانًا وَظُلْمًا فَوْسَفَ نُصْلِهِ نَارًا Whoever does this, uh, you know, out of dhulm and arrogance, will go enter the fire of hell. And our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, كُلُّ جَسَدٍ نَبَتَ مِنْ سُحْدٍ فَالنَّارُ أَوْلَى بِهِ Every flesh and body that is fed with suhd, and suhd is the wealth or the money that is acquired illegally, okay? Suhd means the money that you cheat people out of. So every flesh or body that is fed with suhd, our Prophet ﷺ said, it is more befitting that that body goes to the fire of hell. So, O oh people who are defrauding innocent people, O oh people who are tricking the community, O oh people who are setting up businesses that are false, O oh people that just wanna make a quick buck and you're selling something that is not real, or you know you're intentionally defrauding people of their money, A'udhu Billah, repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before it is too late, repent to Allah before you have to answer to Allah for your crime of taking the money of innocent people and pocketing it, knowing full well that you are lying to them and deceiving them. That is one of the major sins in Islam and our Prophet ﷺ. The Quran itself says that you will enter up in Jahannam if you continue in this path. Also, one of the things that Allah has mentioned in the Quran and our Prophet ﷺ has mentioned as well as being a major crime is that of taking one's own life. In the same verse, Surah An Nisa, Allah says, وَلَا تَقْتُلُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ كَانَ بِكُمْ رَحِيمًا do not kill yourselves, Allah is ever merciful. However, whoever intentionally does so, they shall end up in Jahannam. And our Prophet wasallam said that whoever cut himself with a knife, that knife will be in his hand and he shall continue to cut himself forever and ever in the fire of hell. Whoever takes poison, he shall have the goblet of poison, he shall continue to drink it forever and ever in Jahannam. Whoever throws himself off from the cliff, shall be throwing himself off from the cliffs of Jahannam forever and ever. So the point being that, uh, uh, the one who takes his own life, that person has been threatened with Jahannam. Obviously, Allah is always forgiving and merciful. Obviously, if that this has happened in uh, uh, your acquaintances or friends, we seek Allah's protection and, and refuge. Do not give up hope of Allah's mercy. Make dua for that person. Make dua for the Muslim who even dies in this death. This is a warning to the living. As for the one who has passed away in this manner, we ask Allah's forgiveness to the family and friends, but we need to warn other people to not do this, right? So that's the delicate balance over there. Anybody who's going through, you know, depression or thoughts of suicide, seek help and seek help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through sabr and dua and seek help from family and friends and seek help from therapists. And also there should be an element of fear that we place in this person that, hey, whatever is happening, however bad life is, you cannot take your own life because that will have repercussions or potential repercussions. So we need to keep these hadith in context and realize as well, we have an authentic hadith, authentic hadith of a particular sahabi. Again, this is not the time to go there. He actually did commit suicide and yet still uh, he ended up in Jannah 
because Allah forgave him. So again, we have to balance, again, I'm saying this from the beginning, dear brothers and sisters, these ahadith are threats. The purpose of the threat is to frighten us, but individually it is possible that Allah might forgive somebody because of a good deed, right? So we differentiate between making sure we threaten people. Hey, you who's stealing money, you better be careful. You might end up in Jahannam. It is possible that that particular person repents to Allah later on in life and turns over a new leaf and does good deeds and perhaps is forgiven. That doesn't change the fact we're gonna get angry at him. This doesn't change the fact we will threaten that person. How dare you do that? So the two are separate things. We speak in this world, Allah will judge in the hereafter. We threaten with Allah's punishment in this world, but we have no right to execute Allah's punishment. We simply threaten generically speaking. Threaten by generics, not specifics. Generics mean you should not commit suicide. Generics mean you should not defraud people. We can never say to an individual person, you are gonna end up in Jahannam because you defrauded a person. You don't know, that's not for you to judge. We can say it is possible you might end up in Jahannam or Allah has threatened the one who defrauds people to end up in Jahannam. So that's the point over here. Uh, point number eight in our lecture is uh, the those who create images, uh, those who create images, uh, and some ulama have said this is those who create idols, uh, and others have said any type of image that is meant to replicate Allah's creation, but this has also been threatened with being punished in Jahannam. Uh, in the hadith of Bukhari and Muslim, كل مصور في النار Every single one who makes an image uh, shall be in, in the fire of hell. And the musawwir here, again, as I said, some have translated or understood this to mean the ones who make idols, and others have said any type of 3D image, uh, and some have been very strict and said any type of 2D image. So again, there's a bit of a uh, fiqhi controversy of how we understand uh, musawwir, but for sure, without a doubt, it is haram to make a 3D image, carve it with your hands, or, or do something of the nature of an actual human being and the face of a human, this is not allowed to do. As for photography and whatnot, this does not come under taswir, and that's a different fiqhi issue altogether. Uh, the ninth thing that I'll mention in this list, and again, I'll remind you, it's not an exhaustive list. The ninth thing that I will mention is the Prophet explicitly mentioned that one category that will end up in Jahannam, very interesting, those who tortured animals, those who tortured animals. The Prophet ﷺ said, I saw the fire of hell and in it I saw a lady that tortured her cat to death, that she locked it up and neither did she allow it to find its own food, nor did she provide it food until it starved to death. And so that cat is constantly scratching her in the fire of hell. And uh, in the hadith in an Nisa'i, the Prophet ﷺ said, Allah's curse is on the one who مَثَّلَ uh, بِالْحَيَوَان here, here it means mutilates an animal. So mutilates is a type of torturing here. So the point being that, think about it. Think about the mindset of somebody who's gonna kill an animal, torture an animal. Think about the mindset of somebody who, أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ يعني just throws a cat off the roof, let's say, or something of this nature. How, how cold-hearted can you be? That is the characteristic of the people of Jahannam. That's the type of attitude that ends you up in Jahannam. Think of the type of, of person that's gonna lock up an, a cat and just allow it days to go by, right? Starving slowly, but you, أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ That is the, cat, uh, the attitude of the person of uh, Jahannam. So torturing of the animals, once again, it's not as much the sin as it is the characteristic of the heart of that type of person that's gonna end up in Jahannam. Also of the things that we have mentioned that will lead to Jahannam, uh, remember I mentioned the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, the two categories of people, I haven't seen them and they will uh, you know, not enter Jannah. Uh, so the second category will be, he said, uh, that ladies that are kasiyatin ariyatin ma'ilatin mumilatin, that they are scantily clad uh, and they are seducing and enticing other people. And this hadith uh, requires a longer discussion, but uh, it is there, it is Bukhari and Muslim, it's an authentic hadith. And notice here, this is not the individual sin that a man or woman does in the privacy of their houses. This is not something that flirtation or even zina. This is a lady that is using uh, her beauty to tempt, she is the seductress, very public level, right? That type of person is somebody that is not just you know a private sin, because in that case the man and woman is the same. You see, I understand the sensitivity. Some people, you know, don't you know they don't understand these hadith. In fact, uh, there's not much to really any uh, try to clear up. It's very clear here. Allah has given women a certain privilege and power over men. Allah has given women the type of beauty that has the power to impact 
lots of men. If a beautiful lady chooses to undress herself in a manner that is flaunting her beauty in front of large groups of people, this is not the private sin that is happening behind closed doors. Remember, the, the, he, the Prophet is saying, is saying that ma'ilatin mumilat, she is causing lots of people, right? to be attracted to her. In other words, and we seek Allah's refuge, but imagine, you know, the one that is selling her body online, a'udhu billah, a'udhu billah, that type of person, that she's misleading, misguiding lots of people, even though she might be one person. And look, this is the reality that Allah has created men and women differently, and the bodies of women have certain powers over men. All you have to do is, you know, look at the world around you in a metaphorical way, and you see this is the reality. So that lady that chooses to go down this path, and to earn some money, let's say, by doing something of this nature. So the, the hadith is clear that she has done something that is destructive to society and it is very, very uh, problematic. Um, also, we have uh, as well uh, of, of the characteristics of those that are going to enter or the, the sins that will enter Jahannam, we seek Allah's refuge, is the one who uses the name of Allah in vain, who gives a solemn oath and he uses Allah's name, the qasam, he gives it but he does it for a reason that is haram, that is wrong, that is actually a sin. So the one who has so little iman that he can give a qasam by Allah, put his hand on the Qur'an, a'udhu billah, a'udhu billah, and then lie, a'udhu billah. Or he uses Allah's name, wallahi, and then he lies, and he does it for some measly sum of this world. Once again, a'udhu billah, that is a sin that is promised uh, Jahannam. So our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, مَنْ اِقْتَطَعَ حَقَّ مِرْئٍ مُسْلِمٍ بِيَمِينِهِ فَقَدْ أَوْجَبَ اللَّهُ لَهُ النَّارُ وَحَرَّمَ عَلَيْهِ الْجَنَّةِ Whoever takes the right of his brother by using the name of Allah in a false oath, right? Allah Azza wa Jal has made the fire of hell obligatory on that person and caused Jannah to be haram. So uh, the Prophet uh, the man said, that, O Messenger of Allah, what if the oath was for something small, something trivial? And uh, the Prophet said, even if it is, the small portion of a branch, a twig, even if he used it to get a piece of, of wood, that piece of wood, the, ma the mentioning of Allah's name is something that causes it to be uh, going to Jahannam, we seek Allah's uh, refuge. There are other things mentioned as well, again, uh, don't have time to go into all of them, I just want to give you some of the major ones of them. For example, we seek Allah's refuge for this, but uh, uh, pretending or seeking uh, religious knowledge to be a show off, billah, that this is something our Prophet said, that whoever uh, seeks knowledge to show off to other people, we seek Allah's refuge, we ask Allah for ikhlas all the time. That we ask Allah Azza wa for ikhlas for all that we do, but the one who intentionally enters this realm and he wants to just become the show off for the sake of his ego and fame and he uses the religion to become famous billah, that person also we seek Allah's refuge he has been threatened with the uh, fire of hell and also for example one category should be mentioned as well uh, that our Prophet said uh, that uh, and we'll conclude conclude with this hadith that uh, three are the people that Allah has made Jannah haram for uh, number one mudminu al-khamr the one who is addicted to alcohol or the drug addict even in our times, the one who's constantly involved in the drugs and this, and he never ever repents from this. So that person, the default is they shall be punished in Jahannam, uh, you know, uh, unless Allah has mercy on them. So be careful of the sins of intoxicants. Number two in this hadith, al-aqu, the one who is rebelling against the parents all the time. So one of the major sins that has been threatened with Jahannam is the one who is disrespectful to the parents, the one who turns his back on his parents, the one who does not take care of his parents, that person has been promised as well, uh, Jahannam. And then the third one, the youth. And who is the the youth? Uh, the youth is the one who, uh, billah, billah, he is the man, or even the woman, but primarily in case it happens in the man, who uh, allows other people to enjoy his, billah, his, his, his wife, or doesn't care about uh, other men uh, being with his, his family or something, billah from that, but that is the one that has been promised uh, Jahannam as well. So these are some hadith, and again, this is not an exhaustive list, but this inshallah covers the main, most important ones about uh, the sins that are linked with Jahannam. Please go over this list 
and make sure that none of these is ever in our lives. If anybody is guilty of any of these sins, repent, dear Muslim, because the door of repentance is always open. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive our sins. May Allah azza wa jal cause us to avoid every one of these kaba'ir. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ikhlas al qawl al amal. May Allah azza wa jal grant us humility and humbleness. May Allah grant us pure hearts. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us and our families from any of these major sins. And we ask Allah for his afiyah. And inshallah, our next lecture, uh, inshallah, will be our last lecture about uh, Jahannam. And then inshallah, we'll begin our series on Jannah. So I will see you then, inshallah ta'ala. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. <laughs> فَمَنْ تَعَجَّلَ فِي يَوْمَيْنِ فَلَا إِثْمَ عَلَيْهِ وَمَنْ تَأَخَّرَ فَلَا إِثْمَ عَلَيْهِ لِمَنِ اتَّقَى وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ وَاعْلَمُوا أَنَّكُمْ إِلَيْهِ تُحْشَرُونَ